Next on the news. A mass held at St. Simon's Stock Church, which is just around the corner from the building fire in the Bronx. This as the city comes together to help the victims and investigators continue to search for the reason why the building filled so quickly with smoke. Police are searching for the woman who desecrated St. Simon and Jude Church in Gravesend after the Spanish mass ended on Sunday. Do you know how to use an at-home COVID test? We'll show you what you need to know. Plus, a miracle in New Mexico. Dumpster divers save a baby boy who was abandoned in a trash bin. I'm Christine Persichetti. Currents News starts right now. Prayers and a candlelight vigil being held in the Tremont section of the Bronx for everyone affected by that deadly apartment building fire. Also, an outpouring of help from across the city and the Catholic Church as investigators try to pinpoint exactly why smoke filled the building so quickly, killing 17 people, including eight children. Jessica Easthope has the latest on where the investigation stands. A community shaken and in mourning, coming together in prayer. Calls for a thorough investigation into the deadliest fire in New York City since 1990 took a pause Monday night for mass held at St. Simon's Stock to pray for all those affected by Sunday's tragic fire. There is no way for us to not pray to God all those who are seriously injured, all those who lost everything. Both residents and officials are now searching for answers as to why smoke spread so rapidly through the 120 unit building. The cause of the fire, an electric space heater left on for days. Congressman Richie Torres says residents resort to them when buildings are kept at the legal minimum temperature. The lesson here is that when we disinvest from housing, we are putting tenants' lives at risk. The New York Times is reporting the FDNY said smoke from the flames on the third floor traveled up through a door that would not close to the 15th floor and caused what's known as the flu effect. The building has a history of housing preservation and development violations, including those related to fire retardant materials as recently as October of last year, according to the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. Now the church through Catholic Charities of New York is stepping up to raise awareness and offer counseling, burial services, as well as financial and housing assistance. Let's walk together, let's educate and learn what can be done at home. The value of these little messages from the fire department, this is so important in the action of the church. Now Mayor Eric Adams is urging people to learn from this horrific accident. This painful moment can turn into a purposeful moment as we send the right message of something simple as closing the door. Catholic Charities has begun its outreach to individual families. So far, they're working with about a dozen. Bronx Park Phase 3 Preservation LLC, which owns the building, is fully cooperating with the investigation. Jessica Easthope, Currents News. Currents News will continue to bring you updates on these families as this story unfolds. But in the wake of this sorrow and pain in the Bronx community, Brooklyn Bishop Robert Brennan is offering words of hope that the Lord is with you even in times of sadness. God is there with us in every single tragedy. God loves us so, so very much and uh, shares those, those burdens, those sorrows with us. Bishop Brennan is encouraging Catholics who wish to help to go to Catholic Charities. Catholic Charities Archdiocese of New York is currently trying to help these families both short and long term. You can go to CatholicCharitiesNY.org to donate to their efforts. And if you or someone you know is a victim of that Bronx fire and needs help, you can contact Catholic Charities on either their helpline 888-744-7900 or Go to catholiccharitiesny.org slash find help. Turning now to a helicopter crash just outside of Philadelphia. The medical chopper with four people on board, including an infant, went down right in front of Drexel Hill United Methodist Church. All four people survived with non-life-threatening injuries, and there's no damage to the church. The baby was taken to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where the helicopter was originally headed. 
New York City may be winning in its fight against Omicron and new numbers out now by the city. The number of people testing positive has begun to decrease. The seven day average going down from its peak on January 2nd of around 34% to around 31% on January 8th. Officials warn the data is subject to revisions and could be further affected by the recent holidays. Meantime, around the country, the number of people in the hospital because of COVID is at an all time high. That's according to new data from the Department of Health and Human Services, which says close to 146,000 patients are currently being treated for COVID-19. The number of children in the hospital is also breaking records with nearly 5,000 kids either confirmed or suspected of having the virus. According to the CDC, 98% of new COVID cases are the Omicron variant. The rippling effects from the high hospitalization and positivity rates are being seen in a ton of day to day jobs. Teachers, police officers, hospital staff and airport officials. They're just some of the careers being heavily affected by the Omicron surge. Nick Watts has more on that story. In Los Angeles, more than 60,000 school staff and students have tested positive in the run up to reopening in New York. Trash lies uncollected, three subway lines are closed, so many city staff are out sick. Across Colorado, so many EMTs are out, they're now turning away some non-urgent callers. Upwards of 5 million Americans will be stuck at home over the coming days, says one economist, all down to the Omicron tsunami. Nearly a quarter of American hospitals are now reporting a critical staff shortage with nearly 140,000 patients in those hospitals fighting COVID-19. Much of our hospital workforce is getting knocked out at home with symptomatic COVID. Some overwhelmed testing labs now forced to prioritize results just for the symptomatic. Diagnostic testing is in shambles. And so when you add up the, all of that together, we've got a very serious situation facing our, our nation this month. This country is now averaging a stunning 700,000 plus new COVID-19 infections every day, an all time high and still rising. Thousands of schools didn't open last week after winter break due to COVID. It was a staff shortage that led to the closure. Others closed to slow the spread elsewhere. Strikes because teachers want more safety measures. I agree that the best learning happens in schools, but I don't feel safe at work right now. One North Carolina district now telling some high schoolers to ride city buses because they're out of drivers for the yellow ones. Meantime, city bus services slashed in the likes of Washington, D.C. and Portland, Oregon. Cruises also being canceled and more than 25,000 flights canceled since Christmas due to weather and Omicron. How long might all this last? Well, Alaska Airlines has cut 10% of its flights through the end of January. That was Nick Watts reporting. The U.S. is currently averaging around 700,000 new cases per day. Insurance companies will be covering the costs for at home tests. That's according to the Department of Health and Human Services. Private insurers will be required to pay for eight tests per month per individual. No doctor's order or prescription will be required and they won't be subject to copays or deductibles. HHS says the move is part of an overall strategy to make at home tests more accessible. And stay tuned right here to Currents News. We'll tell you exactly how you should be taking those at home tests to get the best results and eliminate the risk of false positives or negatives. Again, that's coming up right here on Currents News. Be on the lookout. A church was desecrated in the Diocese of Brooklyn and parishioners want to know why. Moments after the Spanish Mass ended Sunday at St. Simon and Jude Church in Gravesend, parishioners saw this woman throwing eggs at the front door of the building. According to officials, police did arrive shortly after the incident, but the suspect was nowhere to be found. Authorities are looking for the woman. Following through on their warnings to Democrats, a group of Republican leaders is suing to block New York City's new law granting non-citizens voting rights. The city council passed legislation last month that would grant more than 800,000 non-citizens the right to cast ballots in municipal elections starting in 2023. If the law is not restricted by a judge, New York City will become the first major city in the country to extend voting rights to non-citizens. 
And with less than 10 months until the 2022 midterm elections, President Joe Biden is in Georgia to make his biggest push yet to pass two national voting rights bills. The move comes as the two bills in question sit in limbo due to a Republican filibuster in the Senate. However, many voting rights activists are skipping Biden's remarks, arguing that the president's time is better spent on Capitol Hill instead of giving another speech. Now to Kazakhstan, where almost 10,000 people have been detained after taking part in protests that originally started over spiking gas prices. Frederick Pleitkin has more from the Kyrgyzstan-Kazakhstan border. Kazakhstan's leadership appears to be trying to show that it's getting the situation in the country under control, but at the same time also continuing their crackdown on the people who participated in the protests that shook that country. Now, the president of Kazakhstan, Mr. Tokayev, he had his pick for new prime minister approved by Kazakhstan's parliament on Tuesday. At the same time, the authorities there also announced that the number of people detained in the wake of those protests had once again risen sharply. The authorities now saying that nearly 10,000 people have been detained and that number has been continuously steeply rising over the past couple of days. The authorities are also saying that more than 160 people were killed in those protests and the vast majority of those more than 100 people in one town and that is the town of Almaty. That of course is also the place where we saw some of the worst violence as those protests were taking place with rioters in the streets going into government buildings but at the same time also uh, Kazakhstani security forces on the ground there as well, sweeping those areas and in some places apparently opening fire as well. That was Frederick Pleitkin reporting the Kazakhstani government is saying the international forces that they called in led by Russian forces have completed their mission. Their withdrawal will start in two days and take 10 days to complete. After praying the Angeles, Pope Francis expressed his concern over the crisis in Kazakhstan. Prego per loro e per i familiari e auspico che si ritrovi al più presto l'armonia sociale attraverso la ricerca del dialogo, della giustizia e del bene comune. Affido il popolo casaco alla protezione della Madonna. The Holy Father also reflected on the scene of Jesus' baptism, adding that we should all know the date of our baptism and remember that day as a feast day. The U.S. is giving $308 million to independent humanitarian organizations in Afghanistan. The National Security Council says the money will go towards shelter, essential health care, emergency, food, water and hygiene services. The U.S. is also providing one million additional COVID-19 vaccines. This aid comes months after the U.S. completed its military withdrawal from Afghanistan. There's a lot more news headed your way. Some are calling it a miracle. A newborn abandoned in a dumpster is found alive. The Diocese of Brooklyn currently has the city's only remote learning option. We have all the details for you. And Pope Francis has a message for all those who spread misinformation about COVID vaccines. A shocking discovery and a miraculous rescue when a newborn baby boy is found alive in a dumpster. Some are calling them angels, dumpster divers in New Mexico who found the infant tossed away in the trash. And now, thankfully, the little boy is expected to be okay. A nearby store owner shared surveillance video that appears to show what happened. John Cardinale has the story. I said, what are, what are we looking for here? And... I turn around, she goes, we're looking for somebody that dumped a black garbage bag in the dumpster. And I said, please do not tell me it was a baby. And she grabbed my shoulder and said, yes. But Joe Embriali is recalling the moment Hobbs police asked to review security video from his store after a baby was believed to have been thrown in it. It should not have happened. Um, there's other ways to give a baby away, but you don't dump it. Um, you just don't. I'm sorry. This security video we received from Embriali lays out what happened on January 7th. You can see on the security video it's 2 p.m. when a white car pulls up to the dumpster. A woman exits the driver's side of the car, opens the back passenger door, grabs a black bag, and throws it into the dumpster. She then proceeds to leave. The girl just drives up like it's a piece of trash, reaches in the back of her car, dumps it and just drives off. 
No remorse. Fast forward to 7.42 p.m. A group of people appear to be looking through the dumpster when they come across a black bag. You can see a woman pull out a baby and begin walking with it. Minutes later, police arrive at the scene. You know, luckily we had dumpster divers back there and they pulled it out and they didn't even know what was it in the bag. That was John Cardinale reporting the baby boy's 18 year old mother is in police custody. New Mexico, as well as most other states, including New York, has a safe haven law which allows a parent to leave their unwanted baby at a hospital, police or fire station without fear of prosecution. Students around the city walked out of their classrooms Tuesday morning to demand a return to remote learning. The call comes as a large amount of students and faculty are out due to the Omicron surge. On Monday alone, almost 13,000 students and more than 2,200 staffers tested positive. City officials continue to insist classrooms are safe. The Diocese of Brooklyn currently has the city's only remote learning option. The St. Thomas Aquinas Online Catholic Academy is a completely virtual kindergarten through eighth grade school for students. The program first began in September of 2020 after COVID forced students to go remote. Some 2,400 students enrolled. After schools began to open again, the diocese realized the needs for this kind of online learning were still there, and so they made the academy permanent. There are still more than 160 students enrolled. Principal Stephen Hassler talked to Currents News about what makes the program a success. Students are really immersing themselves in the content of their classes. We've been blessed with a really good faculty, so it really spells a good start. The school's curriculum follows New York State standards while also infusing Catholic values and doctrine. For more information on the Academy and to find out how to enroll your child at St. Thomas Aquinas, just go to stacoa.org. The Omicron surge is not keeping Catholic school students at home. In the Diocese of Brooklyn, kids are back for in-person learning. Schools are taking precautions, new and old, to stop the rampant spread of the variant. Current News' Jessica Easthope reports from Flushing that educators say kids are safest at school. Happy New Year! Welcome back! These first graders are back in the classroom for the first time in 2022. Mm -hmm. Their first two days of school at St. Mel's started remote because seven teachers were out with COVID. But now they're back. Are you guys excited to be back in school? Yeah! It was a tough decision to make, but in light of the staffing situation that we had and, you know, the, the current rise in Omicron, I believe it was the right one. Are those your sight words? Principal yeah. Amy Barron shows excitement differently. For her, it's more like relief that her students are back in the place where they're safest. We haven't seen any outbreaks within the school, just isolated incidents um, that unfortunately they're happening everywhere. But the important thing is that we keep our kids safe. Masks are still up and hands are still being sanitized. Just some of the many precautions that allowed 70% of schools in the Diocese of Brooklyn to open in person on Monday. Once there were enough teachers, Barron brought students back, knowing they're protected and getting the most they can out of school right here in their classroom. Nothing takes the place of a live teacher. The interaction, the support that they get from their teacher. The little things like telling them they're doing a great job, being able to give them that one-on-one -on -one support, it's way better here in the classroom than it is on Zoom. And it's the little things for the students too. Sharpening a pencil, scooters in gym, and what Ms. Murphy's first graders call a brain break. Are all things that can't happen over Zoom. Teachers say the COVID precautions are a small sacrifice for a big payoff. What they have to do to go to school and they fully understand that and it works out for all of us. St. Mel's welcomed back kindergarten through fourth grade on Wednesday. The school is hoping to do the same for its pre-K classes on Monday. Hey, put your mask on. In Flushing, Jessica East Hope, Currents News. Still to come on Currents News, at-home COVID tests seem like an easier option than waiting in line to get one, but do you know how to use them? We'll show you. And we'll meet a great-grandmother who is proving you're never too old to learn. Her amazing Ivy League story is coming up. Pope Francis is calling for a reality check against vaccine misinformation. While meeting with diplomats from around the world, His Holiness suggested that getting vaccinated against the coronavirus was a moral obligation, denouncing how people have been swayed by baseless information to refuse one of the most effective measures to save lives. 
Vaccinated or not, people are still getting infected with COVID-19. One way to find out if you are is with an at-home test. It's more convenient than waiting in line at a clinic or lab, but you have to know the right way to do it. Masking, social distancing, and of course, vaccination and boosters are the best ways to slow the spread of COVID-19. It is troubling to see these numbers, to see how high the cases are going. But knowing whether you're infected is another weapon against this pandemic. That's where COVID testing comes in. You may be able to avoid long lines if you have access to a rapid test, have been exposed and don't have symptoms, but want to know if you're infected. The CDC recommends you take the test at or close to day five after you're exposed to the coronavirus. 500 million free at home COVID-19 tests will soon be distributed. We will set up a free and easy system, uh, including a new website to get these tests out to Americans. So how do the tests work? Dr. Sanjay Gupta explains. So there's a swab. Most of us are familiar with these by now. So about a half to three quarters of an inch in each nostril, five big circles. Put it in the bottom hole here, shut it. And now we wait. Read the test results only within the time frame specified in the instructions. Here's my COVID test results now. No COVID. So between this test result and me being fully vaccinated, I already feel a lot safer. If the test is positive, the CDC advises isolation to continue for 10 days after symptoms started. If negative, quarantine can stop, but the agency recommends wearing a mask around others until day 10. If your at home rapid test is positive, experts say you should report those results to not only your doctor, but also your local health department to help officials keep a more accurate record of COVID-19 case counts. And just like learning how to use an at home COVID-19 test, it's never too late to learn something new. One Texas great grandmother will tell you that she was bored, so she decided to go to college, but not just any college. The 83 year old is getting her degree at Harvard. Robbie Owens has the story. I still want to be able to go out and be challenged. With 83 birthdays behind her, Mrs. Barbara Ingram of Dallas still isn't ready to retire from learning. I got bored and I decided that I needed to do something mentally to stay busy. So when she'd had her fill of puzzles during the pandemic, the great grandmother decided to take on a new challenge, Harvard. Best school I could go to and the hardest school I felt like I could go to. With her family's full support, later this month, she'll begin her fourth semester at the elite school, studying economics and history and working hard. I have a routine. I started at night at 10 o'clock and studied till 2.30 in the morning. And if I'd studied longer, I probably could have done better, but that was my routine. Oh yes, and having fun. I almost feel guilty that I'm having such a good time. Ingram is taking all of her classes online, but tells me she hopes to one day visit the campus. Already, she's being called a billboard for lifelong learning. So, yep, she's got one of those, too. I, I couldn't process it the first time that Stan and I pulled up to look at it. And while she's enjoying both the applause and the challenge, she says the message isn't just meant for her. There was a lady out there and I got out of the car and walked over to her and I said, well, why are you taking a picture of this? And she said, because I want my mother to see this. So I knew what she meant. She wanted her mother to get on the ball and do something. Because dreams needn't come with expiration dates. We've done a lot of living, but we still have a lot of living to do. Again, that was Robbie Owens reporting. Ingram says the next thing she wants to do is live and learn in Italy. She's planning on doing that later this year. So good luck to her. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.